So we're recording now uh, individually. Uh, then, uh, okay, so le let me continue with this problem. All right? Actually. So what I have here now is that, so, okay, we argued why x has normal distribution. And since I have made my case, or so I believe that x has normal distribution, now we can use the t-test for the estimation. We can use the t-statistic. The t-statistic requires the normality assumption. Actually, to find the confidence. And to find that confidence interval, uh, when you have the t-statistic, the t-statistic will, will give you the following confidence interval will give you x bar minus t, you want a 95% confidence interval, so your alpha here will be 0 0.05. That will be alpha over 2. We have 20 individuals, so n minus 1 is 19, so we take the t, stati the t statistic with 19, the student statistic with 19 degrees of freedom. And we multiply with S, the sample standard deviation, which is given, divided by the sample size, the square root of the sample size, which here is 20. And here is the other part. So this is the T, 0.02519, and this 0.02519, uh, can be found in the tables and S it's given in the problem in X bar so I'm not going to supply those numbers so we can quickly move to something different uh, X bar is 0.9255 and S the sample standard deviation is 0 0.9 Zero eight zero nine, and that actually completes this particular problem. Uh, any questions? The class is interactive still. Any questions, Joseph? It, it, you can see when I have the when I lock the microphone, you see permanently my um, this the cross that shows who is talking becomes orange. No question. No question. Okay. So let me. Uh, I want to go through, this is an old exam, and actually,
Okay, this problem is, uh, uh, this exam is from an older year, 2008, and back then we had actually two different courses, 33-38 and 33-39, and 33-39 was the sequel course uh, after 33-38, so we were not covering probability at all. We we're moving directly to statistics, so we could do more things on statistics, including hypothesis testing via confidence interval estimation. So we will solve problem number six or look at problem number six as a hypothesis testing problem, not as a confidence interval estimation problem. So what is the hypothesis we want to test here? It's here in the problem. The lateral torsion motion is measured with an angle and that angle is given in degrees. So the low back pain is believed that it reduces the range of lateral torsion motion. And, consequent, and consequently work productivity. So the assumption is low back pain reduces the range of lateral torso motion. So we have two samples here. One of people, the control group as we said, no low back pain. This is called control group because this is the group has no problems and has 28 people. And then we have another low back pain problem, low back pain uh, group, which has 31. What shall we assume now? First of all, we have two, actually we have one, uh, actually we have two random variables here, X and Y. Which are the two random variables, X and Y? Elias, we're working on problem number six, so I'm flashing it right now very quickly, okay? Yes? So when you see this problem, and I'm saying this is a problem of hypothesis testing, do you recognize now the two random variables? I'm going to write them. So I'm going to switch now to uh, my tablet. So you have X is lateral in normal So do we agree about the random variables? So let's look at our hypothesis right now. What is the hypothesis here that we want to test? Low back pain reduces the range of lateral torso motion. So low back pain reduces this lateral angle. 
and the sample mean the, the lateral angle is how much you can turn to the left or to the right that's the lateral angle uh, so we we have you see we have sample means and sample standard deviation sample size 28 and 31 so how do we formulate first of all our hypothesis in terms of mathematics how, how can we make the hypothesis so we start with the alternative hypothesis and here is also the now so the alternative hypothesis is that the people who have low back pain have a smaller lateral torso, torso angle uh, torso I would say turn angle not bent angle so that means that in average actually that should happen so the, the hypothesis is that the average lateral torso turn angle is less than an individual with low back pain versus individuals which have no low back pain so the null hypothesis here is the equality of the two means based on this assumption what kind of test do we want to take left or right now the critical thing is how you will set up your formula if you set up your formula x bar minus y bar and we will complete this formula later on then if, if this is your setting then based on the assumption based on the alternative hypothesis you need a right test right tail test that's what we need at this point now we have small samples 28 one and the 31 is the other and we have sample standard deviation so we need to make an assumption we need actually to make two assumptions which are these two assumptions first are x and y independent or dependent well obviously they are independent otherwise you could not you cannot work because you have two samples of different size that by itself indicates that the two samples come from independent populations which means that x and y are independent random variables so now you have to use a t-test and i'm arguing why we need the t-test we need the t-test again because we have smaller samples samples smaller than 40. so we need to assume that both x and y are normally distributed well, is normal distribution a plausible assumption for each one of these two random variables? And the answer is yes, it is. It is because the lateral torso is going to have one mode as a, as a distribution is going to have a, as a, the distribution of these random variables should have one mode. People do not have a smaller angle and a bigger angle on the other side. They can turn up to a certain angle and different individuals can turn more different other individuals can turn less so there should be some it's it's plausible to believe that uh, we have a normal distribution around a certain average that again is something that typically it would be tested from the data so we would plot the data we would do the normal probability plot and then examine based on the normal probability plot that both x and y are normally distributed if we don't have that then we do the box plot so with these two assumptions then we can use the t-statistic because the t-statistic does not restrict the sample size and it allows you to use the sample standard deviation so those are two things that make the T very useful. How did you say they were normally distributed? Okay. Um, I am saying that 
I'm saying that they are normally distributed uh, based on uh, the fact that uh, I'm basically I'm arguing, I'm, I'm saying as individuals you can turn to the left, you can turn to the right, and you have a maximum angle by which you can turn, and different individuals depending on their somatotype, their built up, their fat also, that's another thing that plays a role in their uh, agility. They can turn more or they can turn less. Well, we assume that we believe that there should be one mode in this distribution. One mode means most people will have a certain degree to which they can turn to the left or to the right, that lateral angle. And there are some people who are more flexible, so they can turn more. Some other people who are less flexible, and they can turn less. And you believe that as many people can turn less, as many, well, the number of people who can turn less probably should be roughly equal to the number of people who can turn less around that middle average value. I'm not giving an argument which is scientific. I'm giving an argument which is just reasonable based on common sense. Uh, did I make any sense? Okay. Um, do you guys all agree with me in that one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let me continue now. Uh, so, after, after we have used this, then uh, we have made the determination for the normal distribution, then our T statistic will be X bar minus Y bar, okay, divided, we have two independent populations, and now the next question we are facing is whether we can pull the variance or whether we can't pull the variance. To that effect, what is the best strategy? The best strategy here is if you pull the variance, then you have to assume, actually there are two strategies, either you pull the variance, so you assume that both random variables x and y have the same variance, so pull the variance, which means you create one variance which is common for both X and Y, mixing the data from X and Y. So that requires variance of X equals variance of y, and the other choice is to not pull the variance, not make the assumption actually, and then use the formula, I will show you the formula right now, but this is a little bit more complicated formula, I can show it to you. Just bear with me for a, for a few seconds. You might be hearing my dogs in the background. <laughs> they are complaining they want to come inside because it's late. But they don't know that I have class <laughs> online.
Okay, so here is a situation where we actually Oh, that's the, yes, here's the z-statistic, so I need the t-statistic. Um, so, you see that theorem here, let me blow it up a little bit so you can have a better view. Here is the situation, 9-2 is the formula where we use the t-statistic, both populations are normally distributed, but I do not have to assume that the variances are equal. But I need the independence between X and Y. Then T here has a T distribution with degrees of freedom nu estimated by this formula. Here, this huge formula that you see. And I'm highlighting the formula. Ah. Doesn't work. So you saw the formula. It's this one, which is right above. So you can use either this side or this side. They're both the same. Uh, the highlighting is not very good. <laughs> So, if we try to work now this particular formula, then uh, let's see how many degrees of freedom we have. Let's see, S. Um, can you repeat the question loud, please, loud, because I didn't get a good return. Can you repeat because there is there was distortion now this time? The SP. Okay, the don't worry about the SE. The SE is this one. S one square look, it's here. So it is this part that you need to observe. This S1 and S2 are given in the problem. Actually, S1 is S of X, S2 is S of Y. And if you look at the problem, I can give them right away. So S1 is 5.5 and S2 is 7.8. Now, so what we will do is to calculate this formula and actually since me this number that I'm pointing right now has to be integer, you say round it down to the nearest integer, we don't really need to be very accurate in this computation. So let's look at this particular quantity, S1 square over M. Let's look what that number, what, what this number is on the problem. S1 is 5.5. 5.5 squared divided by 28. Well, roughly, that would be 1 as an integer number. Actually, I'm doing the computation. It's 1.08. So that's 1.08. Roughly, the same is this one. Let's let's do the calculation here. And S two is seven. And this number, the second term is 2, so you have 1 plus 2, 3 to the square gives you about 9. 
Now let's look at these quantities here. We already calculated this. This is approximately equal to 1, even when you square it, divided by 28 minus 1. You have 1 divided by 27. That's a big number. This one here is 4 divided by 31 minus 1, which gives you 30. So you have uh, 4 divided by 30, roughly, that's giving you 0 0.13. The other is 1 divided by 27, which gives you 0 0.03 plus 0.13, that's 0 0.16. So remember that you had 9 in the numerator divided by 0 0.16. So we have about 56 degrees of freedom. What is 56 roughly if we compare it to the sum of the two sample sizes? We have 59 sample points, data points. 31 plus 28 minus 2 would be 57. And we calculated 50, uh, 56 or 58, I think 56. Now, above 50, the number of degrees of freedom is not really very big. So we can use this formula, and now T will have 58 degrees of freedom. Any questions? Question, guys? Um, can, are you writing on the tablet right now? Uh, no, because when I have to, <laughs> to look at that, to, to use the window, the interface window, I cannot write. Because the, oh, the, okay, tablet, the tablet occupies the entire desktop. Okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm not writing. You, you don't oh, see me. Okay, uh, yes, I will repeat the pop. Did, did you see the formula I used? Yes. Okay, so that calculation does not necessarily have to be very accurate. It can be an approximate because at the end of the day, this number will be rounded to the closest integer number. So to calculate new ahead, the first one was um, okay, let me tell you where was this three square. This three square came from that quantity. All of these things here was the three square. One plus two. Now, this one is 1 divided by 28 minus 1. Um, will this formula be given to us on the exam? Uh, no, that formula is a formula that you, you can have it in your formula kit. <laughs> you, there's no way that you can remember, but if you don't have it and you need to use it, once you point to me, I need this formula, then I'm going to give it to you, even if you don't have the formula, okay? But remember, this is an exam which is take home, so I won't be there. You have your book. Open it and find the formula, okay? It's a take home exam. In the final, I'll be there, and if you don't have the formula here, then... I will come to help you. There's no, I, I don't accept that somebody doesn't solve the problem because they don't have a formula. And especially that kind of complicated formula. Is it clear?
You see, so I have done the calculation. So if you do the calculation, then this is approximately 56, the result. So T, this one, has 56 degrees of freedom. DF means degrees of freedom. So minus 0, and here you have S sub x squared divided by, uh, look at the formula. You see, I even look at the formula. <laughs> That one will be divided by 28, and the other one is s of y squared divided by 31. And we do the math and we get. Okay? Any questions? Here we didn't use the, uh, the confidence, we didn't specify the confidence level or, or, level, or at least I don't remember that. The, problem specified it. Yeah, 95%. The confidence, so alpha is 0 0.05, and we do an one test, one-sided test, right tail test. So where do we expect to find the uh, critical value? Where should the critical value be? Oops. Oh, I, um, I was, you, I guess you lost my sound because I didn't lock the microphone. So here's my little calculation about the degrees of freedom, okay? So here's where I made the degrees of freedom. I implemented that formula that I showed you. And now this is here where is the, the statistic, okay? Now, what is this statistic? What is the what is the distribution of t? The distribution of t is the student distribution with fifty six degrees of freedom. What is the critical point now? We have, we want ninety five percent confidence. Therefore, the significance level alpha is point zero five. We mention for per our alternative hypothesis that we will do a right tail test so the critical value will be into the right the right of zero so this will be the critical value 0 0.05 comma 56 56 are the degrees of freedom and we find this value from the book okay actually i can try to find it for you right now. Uh, I think this is still 57. Critical values for t distributions. Okay, so I want 0 0.05, which is here. The alpha is here in this straight line, and this column new are the degrees of freedom. So observe the second column. Let's go down to 56. You see, you don't have you have 40, 50, 60, 120, and the reason is that beyond 32, 33 you don't have big differences in the value. So I, I will use the closest value. Here, which is 60, which 1.671. That's the critical value that I need. So this number here is 1.671. And I compare this number with the value of the t statistic after I have plugged in the numbers that are given in the problem. Once you plug them in, if, there is, if the solution falls here in the critical region, you reject the null hypothesis you accept the alternative. If the opposite is happening, the value sits somewhere here or here, then you do not reject the null hypothesis. You say that we cannot accept the alternative hypothesis, which is blah, 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 the following. You keep it, you, you copy it essentially from the text. Questions?
Uh, can you repeat? Uh, Ilias, you're coming with a lot of distortion. Can you repeat, please? Question, can, can the question be repeated again? Oh, no, no, the variance is not the, the S, whenever you see the side, the, 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 the notation S in the formulas, it's sample standard deviation, okay? The variance is a different thing, it's the square of the sample of the standard deviation. So, so in other words, I, I'm responding this way because I don't know exactly what you meant by that question. What do you mean? What did I plug in the variance? In the beginning, you were mentioning that uh, the variance. Oh, the I. Variance Then you pull them together. So here, I'm guessing the variance is not the same. So we use the formula to calculate it, right? Yes. Yeah. We have to. Uh, what I was outlining is the process. When you do the t test, because the t test has to be accurate, okay? The t test is intended for situations where you don't have big samples. If you have big samples. A big, a big means more than 40, both more than 40, then you have the opportunity to see the entire variability. So the problem is, how do I deal with the, with the variance of both random variables when I have small samples? And there are two strategies, two choices. Either to pull the variance, which results in a simpler formula than the one that I used, which means, which is basically, which is requiring one, one additional assumption that the variance of X is equal to the variance of Y. And this is something that you can explain as a belief. For example, I would say that uh, something which is not true here, if, if the people that have lower back pain can, the, the, can have lateral torso rotation angles which vary equally with the people who don't have lower back pain. Of course, that is not true, but anyway, that, that would be one type of argument uh, because you believe that uh, the variability in the way you turn is basically the same on both populations because both populations have, uh, th that, that is something that, for example, depends on the structure of the torso and of the back. Something like this, for example, that would be the argument, although this is not correct to use it. So the strategy is either I pull the variance or if I don't pull the variance, then I have to use the formula that I showed you. Yes, the variance of the populations, not the sample standard deviations. The sample standard deviations in general are different. So could you do an example when you pull the variance maybe, so I can understand that better, please? Yeah, I'll try to do one, okay.
Okay, look, let's let's look at problem twenty four here, okay? Let's look at problem twenty four that I have right in front of me. And let's look at the silver eyes, the birds. So in this example, you see that the two in the silver eyes, the standard deviations are approximately equal. That's a good indication that the two populations may have equal variances. Okay, let's look now at the populations. Which are the populations? Let's, let's, let's read the problem. Damage to graves from bird population. Uh, so damage from to grapes from bird population and is a serious problem and we have an, reported on an experiment involving a bird feeder table, time lapse video and artificial foods. Okay, so we have here what are our random variables? Time Visit, time spent on a single visit to the location, the location where is the actual grape. So there are two locations, classical, uh, well, grape, vine grapes in, uh, vines in the wild and in the experimental environment. So you have two different uh, random variables here. The time the bird spends in on the vineyard in the experimental environment and the time the bird spends on the vineyard in the natural environment and in both cases attacking grapes. So here it's not very, it's not out of, it's not unreasonable to assume that the variance of the two populations of the two random variables will be the same. Uh, and when we say the same, we don't really mean that the numbers should precisely match. No, they should be comparable after, um, anyway, we do statistics. So we can, we, we can phrase that in a more liberal way, we can say that we, we believe that the variances of the two random variables are approximately equal because what actually makes the difference, what, what, what forces the number spent on the grapes, eating grapes for the bird, to be more or less than the average value should be the same for both environments, experimental or natural, because it depends on what the grape is and not entirely on the environment. That would be one approach. And in this case, what I would use, I would use the formula, which I'm going to show you right now, if I use if I pull the vi oops, I missed it. This is the formula for the pool variance. So let me show you exactly how it goes. 
You saw what I did for T when I don't do the variance. Uh, repeat the question, please. No, no, no. The, we pull the we never pull the variance for the z test. We pull the variance for the t test when we use the t statistic. Okay. So here, in this case, where I pull the variance, it would be this, and in the bottom I would have sp divide it and, and actually let me see uh, let, let me see something real quick okay yes the the square root yes sp so that would be the formula no sample size here because the sample size has been absorbed in the formula. Mm. No, you, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. Um, yes, let, let me write the formula for you. That's the formula. Um, SP multiplies the square root. And SP, that's the pooled standard deviation. Okay? So this is called SP square is called pooled variance. And where is the pooled variance? Here. That's the pooled variance. That particular formula. Any questions? Any questions? Questions on that same page below. Um, they are talking about um, pooled estimator of sigma adjust for any difference between the two sample sizes. Um, can you point to me more precisely where you said same uh, page? Right there weighted average of the two sample variances called the pooled estimator of sigma squared adjust for any difference between uh -huh. yeah the, it, okay the, let me yes, let, right there yes here this one yes Yeah, so what you mean? So what is the question precisely? Uh, do we need to know that? Um, no, no, well, this, that statement says you you apply the formula and this form it, it states the purpose of this formula. It states the purpose of pooling. Pooling means I fuse information. I combine things, like carpooling. We both share the same car. So since you don't have sufficient sample sizes from either population, but you have that the variability is the same, it makes sense to mix the two samples and create a big sample, which is the union of the two, the sample that comes from each of the two populations, to create a bigger sample that will give you an estimation of the variability. And that's exactly the formula that you calculate to use here. Did I answer the question? Yes, thank you. You're, you're welcome. Guys, it's about 12-11. Uh, any other questions? No. Um, will you be in your office tomorrow? 
Tomorrow, no, I'm not going to be in my office. Uh, I got some meetings at the Baylor College of Medicine, so I won't be in my office. Thursday morning, maybe? Um, might. Um, let, let me check my schedule right now. I don't remember my schedule on the top of uh, on top of my head. Um, however, I try to avoid being, uh, you know, meeting people right before the exam. Okay, because okay. it's not appropriate. Yes, it's next week, yes. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome, guys. Have a good night. Sleep well. If you plan to work more, I hope you will stay awake. And you will have a productive night. Thanks for joining me. I, well, I don't have a fancy soul like Jay Leno. <laughs> Take care, guys. Good night.